I don't know what Tim Cook has been given to the Apple Silicon team over at Apple, but whatever it is, I want some because they have been absolutely cooking yet again. My biggest fear when Apple Silicon hit the Mac back in 2020 was that it was so good that they would simply not be able to continue to improve it. So I've been putting the A19 Pro through its paces in a bunch of different workloads to get an idea of how it compares to previous A series and M series chips. And the advancements this year are nothing to scoff at. The iPhone 17 Pro Max has a new vapor chamber cooling system and this aluminum unibody that are designed to help this chip run faster for longer. So let's not waste any more time and let's dive into this because the A19 Pro, well, it might be too fast for you to even really notice in a smartphone does have a lot of really interesting advancements that are going to be coming to all of your other Apple products very soon. So let's dive into it right after a word from today's video sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Anchor's new Nano Power Bank 5K and Anchor Nano Charger 70 Watt, the perfect pairing for your new iPhone 17 series. Nano Power Bank 5K is the slimmest Qi 2 power bank out there. At just 0.34 of an inch, it's thinner than an Apple Pencil and as thin as the iPhone Air MagSafe battery, but it's compatible with all MagSafe iPhones, is less expensive, has a greater capacity, and offers 15 watt fast charging. Thanks to its ultra lightweight design and compact form, you can easily slip it into a purse or pocket, relieving the stress of worrying about your battery life. In addition to the power bank, the charger has also been upgraded. Anchor Nano Charger 70 Watt provides two USB-C ports and 70 watts of power from any type C in a form 41% smaller than Apple's 67 watt charger. This compact charger can also power a MacBook to 50% in just 35 minutes with impressive TUV Rhineland certified low temperature tech and a flip out plug design, it joins Nano Power Bank 5K in being a must have accessory. So to learn more about Anchor's offerings, check out the link in the description below. And now let's get back to the video. Now, before we dive into what makes the A19 Pro super duper interesting, I wanna give us some context. So here is every M series chip ever made put on one graph. This is the Geekbench 6 multi-core CPU score. And what stands out immediately is how, as each generation progresses, we're really stepping up each chip. By the M3 generation, the standard chip was nearly as fast as the Pro and Max chip from the M1 generation. And now in the M4 generation, the Pro chip is actually faster than two of the previous Ultras. And the Max chip is not very far behind the M3 Ultra. So you can really see how Apple is continuously stepping up their chips. And if you wait a little bit of time, you can buy an M4 chip in a base model MacBook Air that's faster than a $4,000 MacBook Pro from just four years ago. Now for years, Apple has been able to deliver extremely consistent performance improvements in the iPhone series chips. Here's a graph showing all the Geekbench scores going back to the A8, and you can see that with an extremely consistent degree, every year Apple is able to deliver about 10 to 20% performance gains. But where things get really amazing, is when we pop in some M chips. Now you can see that the A19 Pro is actually faster than the M1. And that is seriously impressive. The M1 has four performance cores and four efficiency cores compared to just two performance and four efficiency in an iPhone. Not to mention that those M1 benchmarks are from Mac mini or MacBook Pro devices that have a fan. This is a freaking phone. But the other thing that this graph shows us is how correlated iPhone chip performance is to the Mac. While you might not necessarily care about how fast your iPhone is, it is a really interesting preview for what Apple is working on and what's coming next. But it's not just silicon that's making this year's iPhones perform better than ever. It's also the new design of the 17 Pro. That vapor chamber cooling system plus an aluminum heatsink unibody means that this thing can run cooler and faster. But how much faster exactly? Well, I wanted to get an idea of how it would compare to the binned iPhone 17 Air. Now, when I say binned, it's actually binned only on the GPU, but because this thing is so much thinner and has a glass back, one can expect that this isn't gonna be able to run as fast. 
And as expected, in the Geekbench CPU test, we noticed a single core performance drop and a fairly noticeable multi-core performance drop. However, it is worth noting that even with this slightly throttled A19 Pro, the iPhone 17 Air is still faster than last year's iPhone 16 Pro and Pro Max. So this is still a pretty impressive gain in performance for a phone that's this thin. But we haven't even gotten to the GPU because the GPU in these things is, is super duper interesting. We've got these new neural accelerators on the GPU cores themselves, which are apparently there to help with AI workflows, but they also help these GPUs become extremely powerful for other tasks as well. In the Geekbench 6 GPU metal score, we notice a massive jump from the A18 Pro to the A19 Pro. The jump from A16 to 17 and A17 to 18 were both about a 17% performance gain. But the A19 Pro is a 30% gain. Holy cow, that's crazy. And keep in mind that the M4 chip was no slouch here either. It was a 25% jump over the M3, and that's before we even had these neural accelerators. So I think the M5 chip, especially the GPU, is going to be pretty nuts. And that's a good thing because the GPU has always been kind of Apple's weak point. Even going back to the Intel days, they were never really on par with what the PC world and specifically Nvidia could offer. But it seems like Apple's GPU team is absolutely burning the midnight oil because from the M3 to the M4, and then now again from the M4 to the M5, it's going to be a very significant improvement. And in gaming benchmarks, we can see this manifested in a more realistic way. The 3D Mark Solar Bay test, going from the A15 to the A17, two generations, was a 45% jump. Whereas going from the A18 to the A19, just a single year difference, was a 35% improvement. And keep in mind that these things have the same six core GPU layout. So, with the exception of the new cooling architecture, most of that performance gain just comes down to the GPU cores being way faster. Imagine what that would mean extrapolated out to a 40 core M5 Max or an 80 core M5 Ultra at some point. This is gonna be some serious performance. Let me give you some more context. Here's that same graph with the M4 iPad Pro thrown in. That is a 10 core GPU, so 40% more cores, but the score is only 20% higher. Yeah, the A19 Pro is a screamer. The Solar Bay Extreme Test makes things even more challenging, way more ray tracing involved here, and when we run the test with that score, you can really see the difference. First of all, the A15 falls off a cliff because that generation of processor just doesn't have ray tracing at all. And the A19 Pro does even better here, 37% faster than the A18 Pro, and still just 20% slower than the M4 iPad Pro. But just how much of those performance gains are down to the new vapor chamber cooling and aluminum unibody? Because it's entirely possible that Apple could just be disproportionately running the new chips faster if the body is able to absorb more of that heat. So I grabbed all the iPhones that I could find and I ran the Solar Bay Extreme Stress Test. This runs the benchmark 20 times in a row to measure sustained performance. Now each stress test runs for 20 minutes, so I decided to run that three times. So 60 laps of the benchmark, an hour of fully maxing out the GPU, now curiously, most of the phones scored their highest on the first run and their lowest on the second, third, or fourth run, which indicates that Apple is gonna run the chip as fast as possible until it heat soaks the phone, throttles it back, and then it finds a balance somewhere in the middle. The 17 Pro Max starts at 1705 and then dips down and recovers, finishing around 1300. The 17 Air starts at 1545, dips and recovers to about 1000. Compare that to the 16 Pro Max, which starts at 1063 and finishes around 900, and the 15 Pro Max, which starts at 837, finishing around 740, and you can see that the 17 Pro Max drops by 25% from the start to the end, while the Air drops by 35%, whereas the 16 Pro Max only drops 15%, and the 15 Pro Max, 12%.
That was a lot of numbers. I hope you're following. The point being that these new chips can run really, really fast, but they throttle more over time. Now, is this something that's gonna be strictly relevant? Probably not. When you're actually using the device, I don't think you're gonna be maxing out the GPU with a fully ray traced benchmark for an hour. But it is interesting that these new chips do seem to be producing quite a bit more heat. And I think this brings up an interesting discussion. Every year I see commentary saying, hey, why does Apple not just put all of the Apple Silicon efficiency gains into efficiency? I mean, I've never heard anybody complain that their iPhone feels slow, so why do we need them to be 35% faster than the previous ones? Well, the reason for that, it's kind of the blessing and curse of Apple Silicon, because these cores are gonna go into the Mac as well. So if Apple were to develop them to be more efficient at the same performance level, then that would have ripple effects across all of their iPads and Macs as well. So sort of by nature of how Apple Silicon works, we have to have faster iPhones, because otherwise we wouldn't have faster Macs. So I got a thermal camera so that we could take a look at how the heat signatures compare on the different phones. Straight away you can see that the iPhone 17 Pro Max is the coolest. This is about 45 seconds into the benchmark. It is absorbing heat pretty evenly across the camera plateau, whereas the 16 Pro Max has a very noticeable hotspot above where the SoC lives. That same hotspot is very clearly visible on the 17 Air where everything is kind of packed up into the camera compound. But 30 minutes of benchmarking later, you can see that things have evened out a little bit. That hotspot on the 16 Pro Max is still there and it peaks at around 22 and a half degrees Celsius. And now while the peak is lower on the 17 Pro Max, you can still clearly see that it is generating quite a bit of heat up in that camera plateau. Now, unsurprisingly, the iPhone Air is running the hottest here, but it is worth noting that that hotspot seems smaller than on the 16 Pro Max, and it's not really running that much hotter. And that, to me, is a pretty good sign. As we've seen in the benchmarks, the iPhone 17 Air does run the A19 Pro a little bit slower than the 17 Pro and Pro Max. That being said, it is still faster than the comparative 16 Pro, despite the limitations of this chassis, and it's not generating an extreme amount of heat. This phone does definitely get warm, but it's nothing too insane. And to me what that indicates is once these cores do find their way into the existing lineup of Macs, I don't think we're gonna be plagued by these crazy thermal issues. I think you'll be able to fit an M5 chip in a fanless MacBook Air without it becoming an oven. And I think that the cooling systems in the MacBook Pro, Mac Mini, and Mac Studio are gonna be more than capable of keeping up with this chip. So it seems like once again, Apple has managed some impressive gains. And uh, this is not something that was always kind of a given. When the M2 came out, that was when I started to get worried about Apple's ability to keep iterating. Because the M2 generation was basically just slightly overclocking and pushing M1 cores a little bit faster. So there were issues with thermals, but for the M3, the M4, and now speculatively the M5 generation, Apple really is doing a great job at delivering those increases in performance on a core level, not just by clocking things a little higher. So the bird's eye view of the A19 Pro is that Apple is not resting on their laurels. They're not getting complacent the way that Intel did in the 2010s, and they're continuing to push their team to develop these things beyond what any of us really thought. I mean, the GPUs on these phones are just nuts, and I cannot wait to see them come to the Mac lineup. So if you wanna see that as well, make sure to get subscribed, leave a like down below. Let me know what you think of Apple Silicon's journey, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.